This is with the first pick, the CBS Sports NFL Trap Podcast. This is episode 84. Any famous 84s pop into your head, Rick? I got a couple. Yeah, I do have one. Uh, you play for the Minnesota Vikings. Yes, sir. Who you got? Really fast. And uh, Randy Moss. Randy Moss. What do you go to college? Oh, come on. He transferred from West Virginia to Marshall because he got kicked out. Did you freeze? Huh? Where did he go to college? He went to Marshall. He came oh, okay. I went to that workout at Marshall. Oh, all right. Old. All right. Well, before we get into the show, how was the workout? Was it incredibly, uh, was it everything you expected or was it more in person? Well, it was about 45 degrees and strong winds and rain and stuff. And he worked out very impressively. Yeah, it worked out for him as well because I think he actually slipped uh, in the draft a little bit because of off field or whatever it was. Worked out for uh, the Vikings, no doubt about it. You weren't in Minnesota at that point. That was ninety eight. No, Miami. Uh, nope, Chicago. Chicago. Oh, Chicago could have used him. Chicago could literally use him right now out of retirement. But that's a conversation that we'll have later. All right, this is episode eighty four. Shout out the old Randy Moss Hall of Famer. Great NFL player. I'm Ryan Wilson. If you haven't figured that out, that's Rick Spielman. Today, we're grading the top 10 picks in the 2023 NFL draft. But, of course, just through the first three weeks, because that's all we played. Uh, and sometimes, Rick, these high draft picks struggle a little bit to transition from college to the NFL. But that uh, hasn't been the, the case for the most part with this group. They've been pretty good pretty early, and, and we'll talk about that. Have you been impressed with the, the top 10 guys so far for the overall? Yeah. Most of them, some of them, I gave grades that were generous because it's only three weeks. But right. if they're still playing at the same level of six weeks, that grade is going to go down. So Perhaps. I don't I don't know what the person's. Uh, yeah, but I don't know what this grading scale is. Can I go down to an F Debo or is it only if you want to fail them? You can. Yeah, I don't know. There's no rules on this podcast. It's like, again, there's no. Did direction. you ask your teachers what the grading rules were when you got your report card? Or did you I, understand? No, I went in and specifically asked, so I knew exactly what I was dealing with. <laughs> okay. Hey, I Rick, here's a rule. Thing. <laughs> Use a traditional grading system. Don't give them an A, but you could do an F. <laughs> <laughs> I think Devo is at the point in the week where he's had it all with had enough of Rick Spielman. That's no, just... it's just be clear with direction. That's all I ask. I will be. I will say it was very clear to me when Debo said, "Give a letter grade." What that meant, like you didn't give a Z, did you? I, I don't know. If I was, Z is a letter. I could have gave him a Z. <laughs> I should have done it just to be a smart arse. How many? Uh, how many years did you spend in elementary school with that attitude? <laughs> <laughs> All right, listen. If you're watching us on YouTube, at NFL on CBS, you can see on the old official with the first pick draft countdown clock. What do we got, Rick? 210 days until the 2024 NFL draft. That's right. It's going to be here before you know it. By the way, if you missed it on Tuesday, it was popper drop, and we uh, it was quarterback heavy from Bo Nix to Shadur Sanders to Cam Ward and DJ Uyunglele, as well as some standouts from the Ohio State's win over Notre Dame. We also ranked our top five rookie performances from NFL Week 3. That, of course, included our guy C.J. Stroud and Devon a chain who I think has changed the pronunciation of his name. It might be Achan right now. I'll have to double check. But uh, we asked him specifically at the combine, and he said Devon A chain, right? Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, chain. all right. Well, we'll see how that goes. Reich Spielman, if you want to change your name. All right. <laughs> you can find that show in the old podcast feed. And remember, leave us a five star review on Apple Podcasts. Nominate an FBS or FCS college player, and we'll evaluate his draft prospects on an upcoming show. We've hit a handful of guys already, and we'll hit the uh, rest of the guys up sooner than later. So keep the names coming. And if you don't mind, take a second to hit the old thumbs up on YouTube at NFL and CBS and help us grow the show and spread the word about the podcast all around the globe, Rick. All right, let's get to it. We're grading. Now, I will give this disclaimer, and you can agree or disagree or ignore me. It's up to you. But I graded this. I did not positional rankings for these players because if it were doing positional rankings, CJ would be number one no matter what, just because he's played all three weeks and he's been great. But uh, I sort of graded the guys each week. I went through and watched all all the games they played. Some guys were injured, and that's how I did it. Now we can argue about whether that's right or wrong or whatever. But I just wanted to put that out there so it's clear because I know that you like to have as much information as possible. Right, then our our listeners like to have as much information as possible. If we're going to inform them on our opinions, they should understand where we are coming from. So you're you're just giving them. I just looked at them because it said in the instructions on oh, the boy. email, <laughs> <laughs> grade the player. It didn't say by position or anything else. It okay, just, 
watch the tape and put a grade on that player and how you think he's playing. Very simple. You know what? I, I, I had this vision in my head as you were taking a backhanded shot at Debo that I'm going to be watching you in your, in your office there. Yeah. <laughs> and he's going to come screeching across the screen and just hit you, give you a old roundhouse. <laughs> and that'll be the podcast. Uh, you doing okay, Debo? Yeah. He's on his way down there now. He's on, on his way down there now, Rick. Lock the doors. All right. We're going to start at the top um, with the first overall pick at the top in that sense. Bryce Young didn't play in week three because of an ankle injury. First two weeks were up and down, and you can make excuses, and, and I'll do that on some level. The offensive line has been suspect, and when you watch the tape, guys are not getting open, and that's a huge problem. I love Adam Thielen. You love him more than I do, but him, he struggled to get open. He's a veteran. He knows how to get open. Jonathan Mingo feels like he's struggling with where he's supposed to be at times on the field. He's their second-round pick. They have DJ Shark. DJ Shark's in Carolina now, right? Yeah. Yeah, they have DJ Shark, who's flashed at times, but it's it's been um, not a hot mess, but it's it's been a warm mess. And I think Bryce is the quarterback, so that's where the buck stops. But um, I gave him a C plus, and I'll let you tell me how you feel about that grade and what you gave him. Yeah, no, I can see why the C plus, and I struggled. Um, I think I ended up with a B minus on him. Uh, nope, you gave him a C plus. <laughs> just, just because you know, the last drive in the last game he played in New Orleans, he made a couple of nice throws and he threw it back across his body, I think, for the two point conversion, made a night or the touchdown and threw a nice ball. So you started seeing glimpses, but uh, he's swimming a little bit. Um, what does that mean? It just, the game looks a little fast for him right now. And, you know, I was uh, going through, I had to write an article on Justin Jefferson the other day. Highly recommended you read it. I'll, uh, now I'm finding I'm a poetry, Pulitzer Prize writer. Oh, geez. Pulitzer, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Evo, and Brian, you didn't know I had that in me. I didn't know. No, so, I did not. But uh, the game looks a little fast for him. His receivers aren't getting open. He tried to throw some anticipatory throws, but against Atlanta, we saw Jesse Bates come up and intercept him twice because he didn't see the reaction of the the, the receipt or the safety baiting him into those throws. So it became back to being a little more conservative. Uh, I think it's still going to take him some time. I still think he's uh, going to be a very good quarterback. The one thing that's hurting him a little bit is they don't have a very good run game right now. And that's true, yeah. So And they're playing very conservative on offense. He doesn't take many shots down the field at all. So it's very elementary and trying to, I don't want to say not force feed him or for, not force feed him into too many interceptions or too many mistakes down the field. So hopefully when he does come back and if he does come back this week that you'll eventually see him open up the offense a little more and uh, hopefully they can get the running game going that we can take some pressure off him trying to throw five yard outs or slants or, you know, spacing routes that are zero to 10 yards down the field and everybody's just squatting on the routes. Yeah. Just, uh, I was going to give you a chance to give me a grade. You don't even know your grade. So we both gave him a C plus. I gave him a C plus. Yeah, we both did. But let me ask you something about Bryce. I don't know if he's frustrated or not. He, his body language doesn't suggest that he's frustrated, but how in the past have you measured perhaps in the pre draft process and then dealt with, if you had that player, on your team, a player who had a ton of success in college, um, rarely, had to face adversity on this type of level and then comes to a situation where the football team is bad and you are not able to do the simplest things you're able to do in college. Yeah, no, um, he, he's a true pros pro off the field, how he handles his business. So I know he's doing everything he can to work at it. I know the coaches will continue to work hard because it's a new staff. First time work with him, understand what he's comfortable with, uh, Maybe as they feel more comfortable, he can have a little more input on what he likes or doesn't like uh, when they're putting a the game plan together. It's hard for the coach to go to a rookie quarterback who's only played three games, right? Yeah, right. But I think that will eventually uh, to increase, and I think he'll eventually get more productive as the season goes along. So we started with Bryce because he was the first overall pick. In terms of my non-positional rankings, uh, one through ten, Bryce ranked ninth for me uh, just based on – how the other guys have played and sort of how he struggled, but we'll see how that plays out. And I, I still like Bryce a lot and our buddy. Email that we were supposed to do non-positional rankings. No, I just did it because um, 
I always turn in extra credit, but that's not how you just do the, the, the bare minimum and, and go out to recess and beat up the other kids. <laughs> uh, number two, the, the second overall pick, CJ Stroud with the Houston Texans. Uh, Rick, you gave him an A. I gave an A. He's gotten better each and every week. The Ravens game was the week one game. Looked a little rattled early, but then he he tightened things up. And then last week, he was absolutely dealing. We talked about him on Tuesday's show about what he and that offense did for the Jaguars. And let me ask you this. They've had guys banged up on the offensive line. You can make the same a case. A lot of guys banged up on the offense. A lot of guys. You can make the same case for Bryce that we're making for CJ, but why is CJ playing so much better? I think that he has better skill guys around him. And okay. we saw Tank Dow, who we talked about mm. on Tuesday. Nico Collins, who I think is an underrated receiver in this league. Uh, Dalton Schultz at tight. He hasn't played well yet, but he will. Yeah. And, you know, they got a pretty good running back and Pierce behind them. So uh, I think, you know, going into the season, no one knew at Houston. And, and I don't think Michi has even got on track yet as he's trying to come back uh, from his – you know, cancer that he had a battle last year. So, but they do have some underrated playmakers around them. You see separation speed and tank Dell. You see the route running ability and Nico Collins and how unique he is with his uh, pass catching ability. So, and I think CJ Stroud is really starting to click with a lot of those. Uh, and he's throwing a ball. What he throw the ball almost 40 times a game? As I bet you he's averaged about 40 times a game over the first three games. I'll tell you real quick. He threw 44 times week one, 47 times week two, and then 20 of 30 last week. He has yet to throw an interception. And Debo notes his 11th most passing yards over 900, by the way, without an interception by any player through this team's first three games. Got to go back to 1950. Yeah. And he's on right now. If you had to put him, uh, he is the best quarterback to date at first three weeks coming out of this draft. Can you remember, and I just can't remember because I'm older, but can you remember a quarterback through three weeks that you felt this good about this quickly? Boy. Um, yeah, I mean, you can go back to the athletic quarterbacks, like RG3 lit it up his rookie. Yeah, he did. <laughs> he sure did. <laughs> weeks, you know. The, this is more impressive because, you know, the Peyton Manny's kind of struggled. Andrew Luck came out the gate pretty strong, although they weren't winning games. Uh, ben Roethlisberger, I think, when he ended up starting, he ended yeah. up making him to the playoffs, I think, all the way to the, maybe to the AFC Championship. Sure did, 2004 against the Patriots. And the Patriots put a hurting on him, but until that point, he was doing yeah. pretty good. So, But this has been impressive because Bryce – or C.J. Stroud seems like the one that has really got into the rhythm being a quarterback, not like Anthony Richardson, who's a great athlete, not like – uh, Bryce Young, who's kind of struggling trying to find his footing. Um, and this guy just seems to get better and better every week. So I was talking to, to someone in the league about just in general terms about the uh, the test that Bryce that, that uh, CJ took that we talked about. I think it's called the S1. I can't remember what it's called. Whatever the test is called. There was some concern last year, not concerns, but there was uh, a conversation about CJ doing poorly on the test. But one of the conversations was maybe he wasn't taking it seriously. And that's one of the reasons he didn't perform as well, because one of the things that test measures is sort of ability to process under pressure. That's one of the things it claims to measure. That's some of the things that NFL teams look at it for. And I, I've heard that a bad test score is actually more important in the evaluation process than a good test score. So the fact that CJ didn't score well, there were questions around that. And if he didn't take the test seriously and maybe he didn't know, maybe his agent didn't tell him, maybe he was tired. I don't know. But that has not manifested itself in terms of the way he's been playing on the field because it looks like he aced the test. And a couple of times, you got to remember, these kids, wherever he took that test, and I don't know where he took it, um, but these kids are going through a lot during this pre-draft process. Sometimes yeah. they're taking two or three tests, hour tests in a row. So you get to that third test, mm. psychological test, you're just cooked. Right. Uh, you know, or – Maybe I had a workout that day if it was a if it was at the facility that he took that test, or I just got out of a four hour meeting with a team. So you don't know all the circumstances uh, behind uh, when he took that test. Yeah, and the other takeaway is that you know just because you see something on social media doesn't mean you should crucify a twenty year old kid because he failed a test. I have failed plenty of tests, <laughs> both young and old, and you know I just had the benefit of not having everyone on planet Earth know about it. But you know that's not the world we live in, Rick. Yeah. All right. I was always an A student. 
you were all because you always you pestered the teacher to the point that she just he or she just gave you an A, so you'd leave them alone. <laughs> Stop asking questions, please. Yes. I told please you. Please sit down, Richard. Is your full name Richard? Yes. Richard, sit down and shut up. <laughs> uh, do you want me to sit here? Do you want me to sit here? Yeah, where do you want me to sit? There's a whole <laughs> bunch of seats here. We're going to have a meeting. Do you want me to sit in the front, the back? What chair do you actually? Oh, my gosh. Imagine if Debo was your teacher. Uh, I'll tell you this quickly. I don't know if they had this in, in growing up in, in the Midwest, but I grew up in the uh, 80s. I was in junior high school, and our teacher, I remember vividly, I tell the story to my kids all the time, she dragged a kid out of the class. I won't call him out. I know who he is. He was a good dude, but he was acting up. And she patted him in the hallway in the late 80s. And that was something that we didn't even blink an eye at it. This was North Carolina. Did you have those sort of uh, corporal punishment experiences? I don't know if they're corporal. I thought they were regular punishments. <laughs> yeah, you have to get the board. Okay, so that's not that's not a shocking conversation for you. No, not at all. Fact, Dito, has anyone ever gotten paddled in your school? <laughs> Not in the mid two thousands. <laughs> they go straight to jail. Yeah, my dad was a high school teacher and football coach, and he brought he had two paddles, one at school <laughs> and one at home. So, oh Lord have mercy! He put athletic tape around it and then drilled holes through it, so there would be some whip in it. Uh, yeah, you got it. Yeah. yeah, that was the fear. If you saw a paddle with holes in it, the wind resistance was not going to be your friend no. when it hit you hit you in the butt. Yeah, man, different times. My, my my kids are like, what planet were you living on? I say, well, we didn't know any different. And I'll be honest, like, you know, we don't get into this conversation. But when she dragged that kid out there, I was like, all right, I'm going to quit acting up because I don't want to be next. But right, that's another podcast. All right. Number three, we both gave CJ's A's in case I didn't make that clear. Number three, Will Anderson. And that was part of that huge trade up by the tennis, uh, by the Texas to get back to number three. The Cardinals moved down, and they came back up to number six. We'll talk about them in a second. They took Will Anderson there. I gave him a B plus. You gave him an A. I thought he's flashed at times. I thought he got better over the course of his three games. I thought he got better as a run defender. Uh, I thought at times not disappeared as as a pass rusher, but he struggled against offensive linemen in the NFL as opposed to some of the SEC dudes he would take advantage of. Yeah, I gave him an A as ascending uh, because he's getting better and better. And the one thing that really stuck out to me is the energy and effort he plays with. Mm -hmm. He is a Goring Jesse. He's learning <laughs> he, how he's got a quick first step. He's starting to learn how to counter off his speed to power move. Uh, and he runs and chases. And anyone that plays with the passion he's playing with right now, the rest of that's going to come. And watch when we talk about him next month. I think he's even going to be better. But I think this is an ascending player. And I think he's a tone setter for their defense. And I give a lot of credit to D'Amico Ryans because that whole defense, when you watch them on tape, they fly around. They may not be the most talented defense in the NFL, but I would stack them up against anyone with the energy and effort that they're playing with. And I said this, um, I think I said this on Pick 6 Podcast, but I'll, I'll mention it here. Tell me what you think. It feels like head coaching hires are going in the direction of offensive-minded guys for obvious reasons. And the exceptions have to be exceptional. And by that, I mean, historically, Mike Tomlin was a defensive guy. He's gotten the most out of his guys. Uh, Robert Sala was on a good track until the injury to Aaron Rodgers. And that has, that's certainly not his fault. But he um, was certainly a hot candidate. And I thought he, he's done pretty well, given the players he has around him on offense. I think D'Amico Ryans is an exception in terms of being a defensive guy who can motivate in these, apparently, through three weeks, it feels like those guys want to play for him pretty hard. Yeah, and that's the one thing when you're going through this hiring process. To me, you don't label offense or defense. You label who's going to be a leader that your football team needs and who's going to. And that was one of his best traits while he was out at San Francisco. When you talk to people about him and being a potential head coach, uh, it was all about how the players love to play for him and he can get the players to play hard. And they follow his lead. Now, he even, uh, I believe, two years ago, turned down opportunities to interview just because he didn't feel he was ready. Uh, and this year he felt he was ready, and right now it's starting to show up. But it's fun to watch when a young coach comes in like that, regardless offense or defense, and watch how that team has improved from a year ago. Yeah, I mean, another name is Brandon Staley, defensive guy, and he struggled with the defensive side of the ball. Offense is cooking, but, I mean – it's not cooking enough to overcome some of the defensive issues. And clearly that's one of the reasons he's on the hot seat. I'd mentioned uh, 
my, my buddy Jonathan Gannon too, and how he has Arizona playing. Man, that's a great story. Not we're not talking enough about that. Yeah, and yeah, I understand it's Arizona. Everybody thinks they're in the Caleb Williams, but you watch those guys play; they play hard. They might might be the most talented, but what they did against Dallas last week, that shouldn't have happened. And <laughs> no. it, you got a first time head coach, first time OC, first time DC, first time right tackle that we're going to talk about. Yeah, uh, and it's and a quarterback that showed up a week before the regular season started. And I thought I think they're doing a phenomenal job out there with what they have. Yeah, I agree 100. Uh, percent Debo notes here 33 uh, three excuse me 33 percent pass rush win rate according to PFF for Will Anderson. That's second behind only some guy named Micah Parsons, who I think is probably a pretty good football player. And I'll note quickly um, I had, in terms of my non-positional rankings, I had CJ fourth, which sounds low. It sounds low to me, but we'll talk about the other three guys, and you can agree or disagree. And then I had Will Anderson. Number six, a close six behind a, a guy we'll also talk about in a second. But All right, that, that, I've got to roll up my sleeves because we got a lot of work to do on this extra credit. I hope Debo doesn't give you extra credit for the way you have these guys stacked right now. I got extra credit for doing it, but he gave me an F for the actual, <laughs> yeah, the, actual would, the actual book report. Yeah, I can understand that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll go to pick number four, which is Anthony Richardson. Right for this. Get your team ready to move. I'm ready. Welcome, enjoy the show. Vamos. Celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month. I don't mind that. With stories of heroes. Everything's going to be just fine. Home. I love it here. This town. Good people. And honor. You need to remember what you're fighting for. Celebrate today. Oh, and every day. All cheers to that. Salud. Explore the One Mountain Una Familia Collection on Paramount+. Plus. Stream now. All right, pick number four, Indianapolis Colts took Anthony Richardson. You and I both gave him B grades. Um, so much fun to watch. It feels like Shane Steichen and Anthony Richardson are, are a pretty good fit together. More athletic version of Jalen Hurts, which is pretty crazy to say out loud. The only issue for me, and this is why I gave him a B, the injuries and, and not being able to avoid the injuries. The, the knee and the shoulder uh, in week one and then the concussion in week two. And you could say it's unlucky, and on some level it is, but you can do a little better job protecting yourself. You're just not used to doing that at 244. But I think the sky's the limit with him if he can stay healthy and stay on the field. And this Colts team, another team that's playing incredibly hard for a rookie head coach. Yeah, and watching him, he got a B for me because of uh, still I don't feel comfortable him getting through his progressions and his accuracy issues still show up some. And he, um, but he would get an A plus from an athletic standpoint and make a <laughs> with his legs. Yes, sir. So, um, but he's still developing as a quarterback uh, and he'll make some great throws. And you see the hose on the side of his shoulder there, uh, throwing the ball all over the yard. It's just, you don't know where it's going sometimes, but what you're seeing now, what I think you're going to see even towards the end of the season and three years from now, uh, you can see him being one of the premier quarterbacks in this league if he learns how to take care of himself and protect right. himself. So Bryce miss, missed last week with an ankle. Anthony missed last week with the uh, concussion. And both appear to be on track as we sit here on Thursday to, to perhaps have a chance to play in week four. So look out for that. He's the first quarterback with multiple rushing TDs of 15-plus yards in a game since Michael Vick did it in week 13 of the 2002 season, 21 years ago. Anthony Richardson either wasn't born or he was a couple days old. That's how long ago that's been. But, um, yeah, arrows pointing up on him for sure. I had him. I don't need to read these to you. I had him ranked seventh on my list behind Will Anderson and C.J. Stroud of the names we've already mentioned. Yeah, but hopefully at the end of the podcast, you can put up his ranking list if we, or unless you just threw it in the garbage. I didn't throw it in the garbage. I'll send it to Debo if, if you wanted to put it up there since you didn't do it. <laughs> instructions on the email. Uh, that's like if you're a pilot and uh, there's not a card that says land the plane with the landing gear down. You just say, hey, I'm going to land the plane. Didn't say put the landing gear down. So I'm not going to do it. Or by what the rule says. I just, I'm a rule follower. You, are, you have said on more than one occasion, you are literal in your interpretation of everything. So point taken. All right, next up, Devin Witherspoon, fifth overall. Seattle Seahawks didn't play a lot in the preseason. I don't know if he played at all because of an injury. He hamstring. did play. He did play. No, he had a hamstring. Right. Okay. But he he has played in all. Mm -mm. 
Played week two, week three. Didn't play week one. Didn't play first week. Yeah, played week two, week three. 66 snaps in week two, 79 snaps in week three. And, man, he looked like he looked at Illinois. I was impressed with the way he played. Played primarily outside. Played little man. Didn't play much press man. Played a little off. Played some zone. I thought he was incredibly fluid in his movements, whether it's lateral or run and go routes. And he was a contributor in the run game. I, I I liked him a lot. I gave him a B plus and you gave him a B. Yeah, no, I think he's going to be a really good corner. I think he's still getting his feet underneath him. Uh, the biggest issue I had is the grabbiness. He still has to learn that you can't get away with this at the NFL level. But the, the, the quickness, the speed, the twitch, the uh, aggressiveness and run support, all flashes. I think he still needs to do a little bit better job anticipating the uh, break in man coverage, but he does have closing speed and he's got to be a little bit more patient in any type of double move or uh, anything where he wants to bite or play action where he wants to bite. Yeah. Uh, was he the one Ryan? And I'm trying to see, I've seen watching so much tape. He bit on a, uh, was it in a Detroit game where it was a flea flicker? Uh, yep. And he kind of bit up. He did. That was him. So, Amazing that memory that I have. <laughs> that was the one. Yeah. Um, so, but he's going to be a really, really good corner. I was impressed with his movement skills and he plays with some swagger. Uh, yes, he does. And in his defense, he did get burned on that, on that flea flicker. I think went for a touchdown. Uh, but he also had a sense for knowing when to come off routes that were like the routes in the flat in front of him. If he's playing, yeah. And he comes off, and he he's trying to knock people out. And you, you sometimes don't see that with young corners. There's so so much stuff going on in their head that they can't really play football. So I was I was happy with where he was, given that he didn't play in the preseason. Usually, if the dog hunted in college, he's going to hunt in the NFL. Yep, that's right. And in that vein, Emmanuel Forbes, he's not going to be in this conversation. He has had some opportunities at, at interceptions. Hasn't quite. I don't think he has one yet, but he's been close, and uh, that's sort of in that same vein. Um, 10 receptions allowed on 24 targets for Devin Witherspoon, three pass breakups. He has 84.47 QB rating allowed against. That's fifth among rookies. So he's he's making his way. He was number five for me ahead of Will Anderson. I know that makes you happy. Yeah. That's like games. Well, everybody listening to this podcast knows that I usually get this all fixed by the end of the show. <laughs> Got to hang around for that. Yeah. That's the exciting conclusion of your Hallmark movie. <laughs> All right, number six, going to the Arizona Cardinals. Trade down from number three and work their way back up to number six to take Paris Johnson. Played right guard at Ohio State, then played left tackle at Ohio State. We were at his pro day, and he was impressive in person, much more so than perhaps we, we maybe thought he would be. Man, we watched him. We talked about him in the, in the preseason for one of his games. He's played all three games in uh, the regular season, and I don't think I could be more impressed with the way he's played. 62 snaps, 64 snaps, 61 snaps in all those games. Um, no sacks in week one. No sacks in week two. Uh, did have a sack he allowed in week three. And uh, did have three penalties. Two of them were declined, however. But it's hard for me to find an issue with the way he's played in the first three weeks on a team that's supposed to be terrible that we just talked about or exceeding everyone's expectations outside of that building. I think he's been pretty solid. Yeah, I agree. And the one thing that he's shown is even though he's a rookie, he's a tone setter up front in the run game because he may not be always technically correct, but he's going to try to finish it to the whistle. And I love his energy and effort that he plays with. He'll try to bury it if he can. Uh, only thing I didn't, I don't, did I give him a B? You gave him um, a B plus. I gave him an A plus. <laughs> okay. I gave him a B plus because I still think he has a little bit of technical issues in his pass pro, uh, but his feet are there. Uh, People work the edges on him at times. I know he hasn't given up a sack and all that. I've counted a couple pressures, uh, but I think that's going to even get better with time. But to me, he is right now the best offensive lineman in this draft class and maybe exceeded expectations of what everybody thought he was going to be. I agree. Number six, you, you got because he played the offensive line position, but he is feels like he's been worth it. So just to recap quickly, they played Washington in week one, so he had to go up against Montez Sweat. And he did his. He held his own against Montez Sweat. Deron Payne was out there over him sometimes as a as a four eye. Uh, he did pretty good against him. The next week they were uh, who they play the next week. Baltimore. 
They played no, they played the Giants. Giants. So Jihad Ward, Boogie Basham, Kayvon Thibodeau. They didn't play the Giants. They had to be Baltimore. I'm just going off my memory here. Oh, well, you need to recheck the, the memory bank. Yeah, because that's the game the Giants came back and won, remember? That's how they won oh, the game. Okay. I thought that was against uh Arizona. That was the last game again for the Giants. Yeah. Okay. But um in that game, he went up against Boogie Basham, who they just traded for from Buffalo, of course. Shahad Ward, Kayvon Thibodeau, Leonard Williams was out there over him, and he held his own again. And then last week, of course, they beat the Cowboys. I thought the Marcus Lawrence gave him the toughest test of the the three games because he's he's a, he's big and he's pretty twitched up. But again, he held his own, and that's an impressive performance by a rookie who you don't know what you're getting when you when you draft him based on you know once he gets out on the field. The offensive lineman, which is usually the position it takes the longest to adjust. Right. So A plus for me, B plus for you. I was really Im- impressed. And as you said, technically you want him to work on some things, but you certainly love the way he's he's progressed through three weeks. Next up, the old Las Vegas Raiders desperately needed to fix the uh, pass rush game. So they drafted Tyree Wilson, a guy that we spoke with at the Senior Bowl, who didn't take part in the Senior Bowl because of the foot injury late in his college career at Texas Tech. I don't think he had a pro day. I can't remember. We, we obviously didn't go Never to it. Never worked out because of the foot. Never worked out because of the foot. And he looks like a player who is. Never worked out because of a foot. Never worked out because of the foot. He, I see none of the twitch, none of the explosiveness, none of the power that we saw at Texas Tech. And I'm not going to give him an F because it's early in the season, but I gave him a C minus. You gave him a C. It, he's just not the same guy. You have to hope that he gets healthy. And when he does, he's different, right? Yeah, and they're rotating him in there right now, and I think he's trying to kind of ooze his way through things, if that makes sense, and feel his way through things. It just, right. you know, when you watch him at Texas Tech, he came with his ears pinned back and was a going Jesse. You just don't see the same twitch, the same motor. Uh, it looks like he's playing hesitant, doesn't exactly unsure of what he's doing all the time. So hopefully we'll see better progress as he gets more play time. But I was not very impressed with the first three games that he's played in. And again, you just have to think it's the foot. And sometimes that foot injury, I don't think it was a list Frank, but whatever list Frank's brother is one of those problems where it takes a while sometimes for it to heal. He's played 81 snaps. He's had three tackles, just one hurry. And you want more. And I, I get it. He's injured. I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt, but um, Max Crosby can't do it by himself. Chandler Jones is on, on the NFL I list, I believe. Yep. So they need some help there. And that was on full display in the, <laughs> in the way they played uh, against the Steelers. Let me ask you quickly about that. Could you make heads or tails of Je- Josh McDaniel's decision to keep kicking field goals? So they were down eight points late in the game. Well, the the theory is, and I can explain the theory is that if you score, 50% of the time, if you go for two, the, the the stats say you're going to make it. So if you don't make it on the first one, you're more than likely going to make it on the second one, just from a statistical standpoint. Right. So I think that you keep, you go for it. And then you have an opportunity. If you want to go for two, you can go for two. Cause they were down by what at the time? Eight. Eight. With four so, minutes to go. Right. And kicking a field goal. And maybe they felt, I don't know, a lot of times when you use analytics to make those decisions, uh, it, the numbers will tell you to do one thing, but the head coach has to have the feel of how the game is going, how his defense is playing. Will they, if they kick the field goal, will they get off the, will they get the uh, opponent off the field enough to get another opportunity? No, and, they won't. Turns and, out. No, they did not. So. <laughs> You, you yeah. that's on the coach. If he felt his defense was having a great game and knew that he was going to get a three and out and give the offense another opportunity, but you have to score a touchdown either way, even if he kicked that field goal. Let me ask you this as a GM, if you disagree with that, do you say anything or are you just like, no, it's not my place to say anything? No, you know, it's, uh, I used to love to write all game management situations down uh-huh. and it's not criticizing because I, you know, imagine 70, 80, whatever amount of people are screaming in your ear. You got the heat <laughs> of the game going on. You have to make a split second decision on which direction you're going to go. You have people in your ear. But 
what you do. And what I did, what I always, if I missed on a draft pick, let's go back and analyze this. And if I was in that same situation going forward, would I do the same thing? And so to me, those are learning experiences. Those aren't mistakes. And then you put yourself in that situation again, and maybe they're in that same situ situation down the road and they handle it differently. Uh, but, you know, everybody's a Monday morning quarterback and a critic, but put, not everybody can do what these head coaches have to do on making these split second uh, decisions on game day. Yeah, well, people are angry with Josh McDaniels, I can tell you that. Right or not. All right, Tyree Wilson, hopefully he picks it up because, um, man, he was good. He was good before the injury, so hopefully he can get back to that form. Tyree was number 10 on my list of rankings. I don't think you'll disagree with that. Got that one right. Next up, good thing we're doing non-positional rankings because this guy's a running back, Rick. He went eighth overall, B. John Robinson. You gave an A. I gave an A+. plus. He didn't flash in week three like he did in weeks one and two, but he's a difference maker, and I think he is worth the number eight overall pick. Oh, yeah. And the only reason I gave him an A instead of an A+, plus one was that he didn't make as many explosive plays against Detroit as he did in the previous two games. Yep. But there's no question he's not a running back. He's a playmaker on offense in every aspect they use him. Um, in case you're wondering, I had Paris ranked third, and I had Bijan ranked second. Look at that. I can't wait who your number one is. You know who my number one is. What is it because of Debo? Uh, yeah, I'm very afraid of Debo. Uh, by the way, Bijan, 15 tackles avoided this season, tied for seventh most in the NFL. He's averaging 5.5 yards per carry, has 14 catches for 102 yards. He's, as we said, week one, I don't think it's changed. He's the most important part of that offense after Des Ritter. Yeah, no, he's, uh, he would be my, he'd be my number one if I, if oh, I okay. had the, Instructions to rank them non-positionally. Take some initiative. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you just do the bare minimum, Rick. Uh, Unbelievable. Do what I'm asked to do. Out there killing those old timers in pickleball because you're not doing your homework. <laughs> All I got was a uh, participation T-shirt. I got nothing else. No <laughs> recognition. No. I that was like the first time I'm sitting there, and. Every time I go to these celebratory things, and this was like because uh, the resort's getting ready to open here in a couple of months, but they had the ribbon cutting ceremony on the pickleball courts and all that stuff. And my what, goodness, which man that is, and everybody's up there and holding the big giant scissors and sitting <laughs> in the back. And I was like, man, I am a true civilian now. I've always been up there with a scissor cutting ceremony. Yeah, with your little suit on and giving a little speech. Yeah. You can still give a speech if you want to. Yeah, no. Yeah, no one really gives a rat's tail about my if I'm there or not. That's not true. Um, I was going to ask you. So, you have, how long have you been playing pickleball? Two months. That's not true because Sugarman was whipping up on you a couple years ago, wasn't he? Well, two months regularly, I would say. Right? So, where do you rank? What's the age range, and where do you rank in terms of the? Uh, if you, they did a top twenty-five, where would you be? Twenty-four and a half. That's not true. Yeah, I'm pretty athletic. I just these these older people <laughs> are unbelievable placing the ball. And oh, okay. You, it's like you, golf with old timers. Yeah, they just keep it in play. The angles they take, it's incredible. Uh, you know, how old are you? Seventy three. What's the score? Well, you're getting pickled right now, eight to nothing. You have zero. <laughs> so, seventy three year old can take you behind the woodshed and pickleball. Well, we play doubles. We don't oh, okay. Play okay. So, but yeah, it's uh, not, it's a little bit of a finesse game as well. It's not all hammer. And I'm learning that you don't have to hammer everything. You strike me as a hammer first, second, third. Oh guy. my God. It's going, it's going, it's either going into the river behind the pickleball <laughs> course, or it's going to be a great, it's going somewhere. I just don't, I'm kind of like some of these quarterbacks we talk about. It's going, I just don't, just don't know, know where. where. Yeah. I don't know if drop shot is a shot in pickleball, but I feel like a drop shot isn't in your repertoire. I'm working on that on my drill work on Thursdays. Oh, my instructor. God. He's got a coach, Debo. All right, number nine, going to Debo's Eagles. This dude could have been the first overall pick. Went ninth overall, Jalen Carter. A-plus for me. You gave an A. He hasn't been dominant on every single play, 
but he draws a lot of attention. Certainly helps that Jordan Davis is standing next to him a lot of the times, and they have all those dudes on the defensive line. Draws double teams. Sometimes he beats double teams. He if they move him inside, over they had him playing zero a little bit. They have him playing three. And if he's inside, I feel like if you're a center or a guard, you are praying that it it, it works out better than you think it's going to work out because he has been pretty consistently dominant and he appears to be pretty focused because that was one of the concerns coming out of school. Yeah. Then I watched the Minnesota game and I felt bad for the backup center and it was just a mismatch on some of those plays. He just is so powerful, so explosive, so quick twitched. They seem to have him playing hard. It'll be, hopefully he'll continue to play at that level. Um, but right now he would be, if you redrafted and he didn't have all of the, Concerns coming out, he would be the number one non-quarterback, I believe, taken in the draft. He's my number one on my non-positional list based on three weeks. Uh, Debo notes two forced fumbles, one and a half sacks, 15 pressures. That's second in the NFL. PFF has him graded as the highest interior defensive lineman in the plan, uh, on the planet. <laughs> so that's pretty good. What's All the right. odds now, Debo, of him winning defensive rookie of the year? I oh, said yeah. he get 10 sacks to get into the consideration of defensive rookie of the year. Is yeah, it he, he might not need 10 to to win that. He's definitely the favorite. I'm getting up the exact odds right oh, now. Oh, he's the favorite right now? I didn't know who number 2 would be. I think Will Anderson second on the defensive oh, side. Okay. So is it like if I put a dollar down I can win 100? Is it mm -hmm. like that that like 100 to plus 100? I don't think it's that. So right. Jalen Carter actually Minus odds, uh, wow. minus 110. Oh, so I don't want to bet that I'll lose $109. <laughs> exactly, well, you got it. Will Anderson's still there. Brian Branch is still there. Tuli, look at it. Tuli, uh, Tuli Tupelo, too, is on the list now. Yeah. And Christian Gonzalez has had a good start of the season. We didn't talk about him because he was a draft in the top 10, but we've been talking about him almost every week in terms of the way he's played. There's your Jack Campbell plus 3,000. So put a dollar down, you'll make $30 million. Yeah. No, it's $3,000, right? You got to learn what this betting stuff is. I got to learn the game. <laughs> learn the game. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, Van S. Flash a little bit. I was watching him against Darnell Wright. Uh, he's not going to, he's, I don't think he's winning rookie of the year, but I was happy to see him play, get a little run. Nice yeah, he does. And they, oh my God, they have some dudes in that Green Bay rotation too. Yeah, which do. brings us to the aforementioned Darnell Wright, 10th overall pick. The Bears had a chance to take Jalen Carter. They traded down from nine to 10. They took Jervon Dexter in the second round, the defensive tackle out of Florida, who we saw at his pro day. Took Darnell Wright here at 10. And I gave Darnell Wright a B. You gave him a B minus. You talked earlier about Paris Johnson lacking at times some of the, the technical things you like to see. It felt like Darnell Wright was holding on by the seat of his pants sometimes. And, and I don't know if that's just him learning, if that's just the hot garbage nature of that Bears offense right now, because there's a lot of things to point fingers at. He's been one of the few bright spots, I feel like. And I think you'd probably rather have Jalen Carter because the defense stinks, but he has been pretty important to keeping Justin Fields from getting sacked 50 times instead of 38 or whatever it is. Yeah, I had I had a tough time keeping him out of the C category myself. Okay, so he would have been wor your worst rated player at no, the top ten at nine. Okay, nine. All right. So what what were your concerns with Darnell? Uh, I think he's playing with a high pad level. I don't think he looks as he looks heavy legged to me. Uh, I Does do that like, mean like getting slow getting out of his sets or whatever. Yeah, and look hesitant. I do think, like, in the run game, he's relying too much on his upper body strength. Like, he'll throw some guys around, but he's not moving his feet. His feet are dead when he makes initial contact, which really bothered me. Uh, I thought he struggled in pass protection, again, because his feet are, or his pad level is so high. He struggled with the twitch counters back to the inside. I thought this guy has really uh, struggled and – did not play to the way we saw him play in that Alabama game. And maybe he's still learning. Maybe he's still hesitant because he's getting the protections down or whatever. I do like his physicality, but I didn't like the athleticism that I've seen so far. Okay. No, that's interesting. And that's good to know because that's uh, I had a little different read on that. How much of that do you attribute to being young? How much of that do you attribute to being in perhaps a dysfunctional locker room because things are not going well for them. The offense looks to be a mess, or is this just solely you're putting this on Darnell? As I'm just watching him as a player. Okay. 
And it's like I said, I recognize the power and the strength that he has. Um, but I don't think he is playing with quick enough feet. And I think he's just playing to play. And I think maybe they've worked, you know, hundreds of reps on technique, but it seems like when he's out there, he's just like trying to get a bar room fight. Okay. Um, I had Darnell ranked number eight on my list ahead of Bryce and ahead of Tyree. I will mention this in the Tampa Bay game, our guy, Christian Itzy and the undrafted free agent out of Rutgers bliss off the slot. He one arm push, pull Darnell to the ground, <laughs> 200 pounds, five, nine, whatever he is. I was like, sweet mercy alive. Our guy, Christian isn't messing around. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's shouldn't happen. No, it shouldn't. But I, that's more of a high five to Christian. I don't want to call out Darnell. He's you've already crushed the poor, poor young man. <laughs> So if you're watching on YouTube, Rick, here's my final list. And you can see how many pluses I went with the guys <laughs> that I loved at the top. My God. Um, I mean, it's easy to make a case that CJ should be number one. But just in terms of, like I said, non-positional three games or how many games these players end up playing. Jalen was number one, Bijan, and then Paris. Then CJ at four. I like Devin a little bit better than you did. Will Anderson, you liked a little better than me. We were about the same on Anthony. I like Darnell a little better than you, although I don't know if you have him ranked around eight anyway. Probably yeah. have him higher than Bryce, maybe? Uh, no. I mean, I'm sorry. You'd have Bryce a little higher than Darnell, I would imagine. I, yeah, I would go Bijan. Then I'd go CJ. Then I'd go Jalen uh, Carter. Then I'd go Will Anderson. So oh, let me stop you there. Will Anderson ahead of Paris Johnson? Oh, God, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, and then I would go with uh, Witherspoon, Richardson, Bryce. Right, Wilson. Okay, that's a little different list. All right, a lot of different list. Yeah, and I don't have all these. You know, it didn't say in the instructions that you can get <laughs> three pluses to one guy. Just so you were clear, you know, D, uh, Debo only has twenty four hours in the day. If he had to write detailed instructions for you, they'd be forty pages long about how to do a, a top ten list. <laughs> I wanted to bring up last year's top ten, and I know we have you know a full season plus from seeing these guys, but I feel Ooh. like you know at the start of their careers, this year's draft class seems off to a stronger start than twenty twenty two. What do you think? All right, Rick, I'm, here's what I'm going to do. I know we didn't prepare for this. I'm going to ask you for a letter grade. You can do pluses okay. or minuses if you want. Uh, we'll go down the list. And if you don't feel comfortable with it, I'll do the letter grade and you go to the next player. So first overall, Trevon Walker. C. I agree with that. Uh, n- number two is going to be an A++. We know that. Aiden Hodgson, number two to the Detroit Lions. A. Yeah. Number three, Derek Stingley. He's back on IR, struggled with hamstring last year, I believe. Went number three to the Texans. Uh, B, because of injury. So if he's healthy, he's pretty good. Yeah, I was going to say C plus because of injuries, but healthy, I agree. Sauce Goddard, number four. A. A plus or A? A. Okay. I'll give pluses. That's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, sauce went to the Jets, of course. The next pick, the Giants to cave on Thibodeau, edge rusher. B. Uh huh. Oh, boy. Six, Carolina Panthers took uh, left tackle Icky Kwanu. C. Yeah. I mean, that might be generous if we're being honest. Number seven, the Giants took Evan Neal out of Alabama. B minus. So you think Evans played better than Nikki? Yes. I think it's been close. Doesn't get plus, but he gets minuses, Debo. All right, yeah. number eight, the Falcons took Drake London. B minus. Yeah. I, I wish they would use him more. Number nine, the Seahawks took uh, left tackle Charles Cross, who has battled injury this year, but was really good last year. Uh, B. I'm going to give him a B plus, A minus. He's He was really good last year. Yeah. Unfortunately, got hurt. And then finally, the, the Jets took at 10, Garrett Wilson of Ohio State, the wide receiver. A. A, that's right. So do you agree with Debo that this year's through three weeks class feels better at the top 10? It's just different with quarterbacks, too. You know, three quarterbacks and zero last year. Zero last year, which is nuts. Well, yeah. No, I I would stack this. You know, there's some good players here. I mean, you got two guys that were rookies of the year. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) I don't know. This is a pretty good – if you took the quarterbacks out of this year's draft class and then try to stack the position, take quarterbacks out and just yeah. get the top position players without quarterbacks in there. It'd be interesting how it's stacked up. This group in 2022 actually might win. Yep. I think that's a good point. All right. Love it. Thank you for your uh, off the cuff impromptu answers there. Now you don't like that, Rick. I'm sure I'll get an angry email about it after the show, but 
you did really you did good i'm pretty good off the cuff though i uh rolodex gets rolling i kind of like that that's right that is true it is pretty interesting that you don't forget anything except people's names (laughs) you don't forget the name you just don't know how to pronounce it but everything else you remember yeah you're right well i'm sorry (laughs) and i don't remember anything except the names imagine the how dangerous we'd be if we put our minds together all right i think that's it we're done right debo yep man love it all right love it yeah, I gotta go. I gotta go back to my tailor. I'm glad we didn't have to talk about Oregon again, or we'd still be on another half hour. I know. Uh, hopefully, the Oregon fans appreciated that. And uh, who's the guy that you know? Oh, the Puka Nakua fans hopefully appreciated it too. <laughs> All right, that's it. You that's wrapping up. Puka beats. What'd you say? Puka beats. Puka beats. There you go. <laughs> um. All right, that's it, Rick. That's a wrap on episode 84. Number fam- famous 84, by the way, in case you didn't remember Randy Moss, which you did. Shannon Sharp, another Hall of Famer. Yep. I I scouted him at Savannah State. So he came out. He's a little bit older than me. So you were you were just in a league at that point. Were you still at Blesto? It was my S- Blesto area. Yep. Yeah, okay. What did you think of him coming out of Savannah State? Undersized tight end. Undersized tight ends didn't play in the league back then. <laughs> that's true. I think he made it on special teams initially, too, though. Yep. And then he, he turned the corner. It was just sort of funny because his brother Sterling was just a big wide receiver. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if they were the same size or if Sterling was even bigger, but one played tight end and one, one played wide receiver. All right. Shout out to Shannon Sharp, episode 84 in the books. Thanks as always to my guy, Rick. Thanks as always to Debo for producer. And thanks to you guys who watch, listen, and comment. Enjoy the football this weekend. And we'll see you back here on Tuesday.